looking at his recommendations as to the need or so forth to form a have a municipal court. So with that, Mr. Roloff, would you sure. please thank, start? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, there is a report that uh, I believe you received over the weekend, either electronically and or hard copy. But I do have a couple extra hard copies. If uh, if the council's all set up, certainly members of the audience, if you want an extra copy, I've got I've got them here. Uh, I'll save one just in case one of our council members shows up without one. So just but certainly welcome to share it. Um, the uh, presentation I have is going to cover uh, these general areas, and hopefully the pointer will work. Otherwise, we'll be hanging out. Uh, somebody else will be hanging out over there. Um, John, I guess maybe you are off the hook from sitting next to me. If you could okay. maybe advance the, the slides. No problem. Um, first, what I wanted to do is uh, yeah, get a general scope of the project. and. Uh, some of the thoughts that were uh, why we might want to pursue a municipal court were greater source of revenue for the city, better enforcement of city codes, and greater compliance with city codes. What we did was we talked to a variety of contacts and contributors. This is in the study, but I just wanted to give you an idea of uh, the, the, the depth with which we uh, pursued this issue. Uh, we talked to judges, the district court administrator, that if you want to set up a municipal court, you have to work through the uh, the district court administrator but we talked to other municipal courts uh, did some surveys as well we surveyed our police department personnel got some good input from them and then just inputs from all the different city departments so they were they were very helpful with doing that um, the overview of the study itself and the sections that you saw were and this is what I'll talk about this evening uh, effectiveness municipal court uh, facility needs for court startup costs which are <coughs> kind of go hand in hand with facility needs uh, expenses that we would expect out of municipal court, the revenues that we would expect, and then a combination of analyzing those to see uh, what net cost or net revenue might uh, come from that. And then just general observations and then just give some time for council to have some discussion uh, and questions of staff. So we, we've got staff from many of the departments that were uh, associated with this. Uh, in terms of effectiveness, uh, as staff looked at it, we and as we talked to different people, there were a variety of advantages and disadvantages, and we thought we'd lay them out for you. They're, they're in much more detail in the report itself, but certainly court uh, provides a sense of solving problems at the local level, and I think that that was something that was, was felt. Uh, the, the judge would be elected by the residents of Oshkosh, and the only responsibility that the judge would have would be to address issues related to the city, no other issues or uh, distractions. Um, overall penalties and forfeitures would be less costly. There are a lot of costs that are associated with a forfeiture. There are court costs, but then there are costs that the state uh, and the county collects. Um, a lot of those would be eliminated. It would be the fine, the forfeiture that we have in our code, plus our court costs, plus five dollars to the state. So it th would be less costly. Um, as I said, the municipal court gives exclusive attention to city matters. Uh, you do have some ability to control the court schedule with the assistance of the municipal judge, and that's probably one of those areas that it, it all depends on how effective that municipal judge is, but that would be somebody that would be elected by the people. Uh, the council would not have any uh, appointing authority with that unless the judge left office prematurely and the council wanted to fill a vacancy until the next time around, but the council would not be able to appoint uh, like you do the city manager or anything like that. Um, perception that convictions in, in municipal court are less public, I guess it's a matter of opinion. It, uh, it does not show up in uh, what is, what's the system, Lynn? It's a, yeah. Yeah. Well, Wisconsin Circuit Court Access System, so it, which ends up being CCAP. So uh, that wouldn't show up on CCAP, so if somebody wanted to uh, pursue what local violations were there, you would have to seek another way. It would basically come and make a public records request with us. Um, but they're still public. Some of the disadvantages, uh, it would be a duplication of existing resources because um, the, the county court's already in place. It would not provide us with any relief from expenditure restraint because uh, we do that by, we would be doing it by choice, not like when we turned over all the operations for the health department. There was a, there was a benefit when we, uh, to the county when we transferred it to them. Um, 
it would be unlikely that taxpayers will see any reduction in the tax paid to support the court system <coughs> at the county level, and then they would have the added cost here. Uh, one independently elected judge, and I mentioned that there's no legislative or administrative oversight. It's really just making sure that they cooperate. With that said, I've had municipal judges had very good relationship with the municipal judge. Uh, it's just an issue that's out there, but uh, when there are issues, you just have to address them uh, and, and work through them. Uh, matters may be appealed to circuit court. Anybody who doesn't like the decision of the local municipal judge has every right to take it to circuit court. It doesn't happen a lot from what we've talked to people, but it is out there. If it's something that would involve uh, um, multiple fines or something like that, they might want to take it to uh, circuit court. Uh, and then finally, uh, perception that municipal court's more professional and carries more weight of authority. Um, the reason for that is that there is no specific requirement for a municipal judge to have, say, a law degree. Uh, it can be anybody. When it was, when I had a judge in Grand Shoot, the judge was the, uh, the high school math and shop teacher. That was that person. I would say he was a very effective judge, but th the perception that that's less professional is, is is out there. So those are uh, some of those uh, disadvantages. There are some other issues that are maybe, uh, as I put in the report on page four and five, that are, um, and I should say, you know, City Attorney Lawrence did a lot of these. They're probably more neutral type of things, but those are things that you take a look out for. For example, perception that the court would be more reluctant to lower forfeitures or dismiss. There is no facts that that state that that's why a lot of these were perceptions and we thought it was appropriate to point them out their perceptions they are not necessarily realities and that's something that the, the council would have to to factor in themselves as far as startup costs um, the real startup costs begin with facility needs and so based on the research we did and, and, and based on my experience in, in managing a municipal court the courtroom is one obvious one but there's also judges chambers um, Judges' chambers are typically used for not just the judge's office itself, although that's important, obviously, but also when there are juvenile cases, typically a judge will uh, bring the people into the judge's chamber so that their the courtroom can continue to, to operate. Clerk of courts, records, and storage is probably the other one that's, that's uh, overlooked a lot. Once you get into records, even though a lot of it's computerized, there's a lot of paper files that you still maintain. Uh, especially if somebody wants quick access to something. So that's, that's their uh, waiting areas. Um, whenever you have a, a, a flurry of cases, there has to be a place for, for people to wait. Um, a hallway just isn't necessarily the right place. Uh, hallways, uh, as I think Captain Shaney can tell you, can get pretty crowded over at the courthouse when, when, uh, Very much so. when it's court commissioner uh, day. And of course, a pretrial area where the prosecutor uh, we have a, a prosecutor that's on contract with us. Uh, they generally meet with uh, people coming in and try to get things resolved uh, prior to going to the judge, and sometimes they get those things resolved, but you do need a pretrial area. So you need all, all five of those areas. Um, we looked at potential spaces, and the three uh, that we identified and one we analyzed, uh, first, repurpose the existing county courtroom spaces. Second is to uh, potentially use the council chambers, this room and the, and the other room, for, and the fourth floor areas within City Hall, and then thirdly, lease office space. Um, there's more detail in the report itself. Um, I'm not going to get into the specific details of two and three because they're really just additions to number one. Um, number one, could be, uh, the safety building could be easily repurposed. It is a little tired. Um, I will say that because just we haven't done anything over there because we knew that eventually the courts were going to be moving out of there anyway. Um, there's uh, a possibility to do that, and the costs are identified in the report. Um, Council Chambers Room 404, because we really need five distinct areas, 404 would serve as the chambers, but we would be really pressing our facility needs to, to get the other ones, particularly the clerk of court areas. That's probably the one that would get the most traffic after the courthouse and that's the one that gets the traffic mostly on a daily basis the court uh, the, the courtroom itself is only when uh, courts in session uh, but you could have one or two days a week and that would take up this room so we didn't focus on that for purposes of, of this analysis um, so the cost the facility costs themselves are identified 
uh, in these areas, facility renovation, office equipment, furniture, technology, which is probably the biggest hidden cost, audiovisual, security, and signage. I will say that as <coughs> staff interviewed folks that had set up a court um, and had studies done, one of the most widely overlooked area was upfront costs and facility costs because they, they, they didn't look at that as much. Um, so we took a strong look at that because we wanted to make sure what courts uh, costs that they had incurred as they were setting up. So some of those are in the facility renovation side. John, if you can move that. Uh, facilities, anywhere from 56 to 130,000. The technology, most of that is with a program that is required of all municipal courts. Uh, and it, it costs roughly $100,000 plus. Uh, and that's detailed in the appendix. Uh, there, are, there are two appendix. The uh, appendix A identifies, it's called a Lexus Nexus, uh, and for a community our size, that's over $100,000. And then there are other costs, and they can go uh, depending on how, how big the staff is and other facility needs that we'd have. Um, but clearly the biggest cost has to do with uh, the software setup that we would need for uh, for court software. Can I ask a question on that real quick then? On that LexisNexis, um, they have that available through the university, university, correct? Through their databases? You're thinking I, of a law library. Yeah, I think you're thinking of the LexisNexis does a law library. Yep. This is actually the court records storage oh, program. Okay. Gotcha. So it's, it's a different okay. program that they also do. Their operating costs so hold the other half of that question though because that that is applicable in the next in the operating side of things um, so these are the, the basic costs and we do have a contingency in there so it's 205,000 to 318,000 we uh, the last year of rent that we're going to be getting from the courts um, for rental of the safety building we'll still have that that last seventy thousand dollars so that can get offset so the net cost would be more like 134 to 248 the, the reality is is that's probably the fair number to analyze because regardless of whether we set up a court or not we're going to do something over there at that building and it would be unfair to say oh we're not going to do anything over there we're going to spend money over there at that building to to whatever we ultimately decide to do so um, I think it, the net cost is, is appropriate to point out in this case because we'll spend it anyway. Um, just depends on what. So these are the, the estimated startup costs. Then there are operating expenses. And we, again, took a range of what those potential costs would be, uh, depending on uh, volume and uh, how efficient uh, the court can be. It'll be less efficient starting out, and it'll get more efficient as time goes on. And that's just how things go. But what we're estimating is a judge from half time to three quarters time based on the caseload that we know we, we generate out of the uh, court commissioner's office and what other communities do, we know that that's, that's the correct range. Two clerks, uh, full time. Uh, interpreter services are on an as needed basis, but if, there's, uh, if, somebody, if there are language barriers, we're required by law to provide an interpreter. Uh, a bailiff, we've put that as optional, but we've got the costs identified on the high end. Um, the, the, the Chief Smith believes that if uh, we would need a bailiff and he's concerned about being able to use uh, on-duty officers who may come in to testify, having them serve double duty is a concern. So we have that in there as a range. But on the low end, we have a zero on that. Um, collections clerk, uh, that would be for additional volume that we'd have downstairs. Some places put it into the clerk of court's office other places keep it separate, we keep it separate. So some places you'll see that they have a more clerks in their municipal court. That's because they're also doing the collections. We're separating it out here. And then finally, with extra space uh, usage, uh, the court covers the custodian services for the court itself, uh, for the county court. So we would have to add some custodian time. So we added just a quarter time. As you see from Appendix B, uh, there, there's a lot of information in there from the, uh, from the report. The, uh, the range in costs uh, are a low of 300000 and if you could advance the slide, a low of 300000 to a high of roughly 400000 That's the range. These are the operating costs associated with it um, to just give you a rough idea of what, what those costs are. Uh, what else fits? Uh, yeah, just back on the other slide. Um, or do you want us to just say slide? until the end? No, go ahead. Um, okay, so if we have a half-time judge 
and that's based on us having maybe a slight increase in citations over 2014, 15, or 16. So I think the high end was around close to 10,000. Um, was there any projection as to like, how did they determine the amount of time that we would need from a judge and two full-time clerks? I guess I'm kind of curious why we would need that. We're trying to give a low and a high range so that the council gets an idea. We wanted to say, look, if, uh, if it runs more efficiently, it's going to be it's going to be on the low end. But uh, starting up and uh, backlog will occur when you got a new judge. It's going to take a little time. It could be three quarter time or volume. And Lynn and, and I can tell you right now, our part time prosecutor does about half time. So you know, looking at what we're actually doing in court right now, mm -hmm. that's about where we're at. But how does the half time or even three quarter time? How does that relate to two full-time clerks? The clerks need to be there every day. So if, if you're getting a, a um, citation you want to come in and pay or you have questions about it, they, they handle every ticket. So a judge is only going to handle the ones that you yep. know, get contested in court mm -hmm. or that people show up in court. The clerks need to you know, enter the tickets into the computer system deal with any payments that are made, any notices that need to be set out. So there's a lot more work for the clerks than actually the judge. Yeah. So that's not <coughs> something that we would have in our city clerk's office. This would be over there and housed there. As I've been to some courthouses where you may have a, a municipal court, but then you're actually going through the regular city clerk to pay like traffic citations and things like that. It depends. If the volume that we would be projecting, I just don't think there's any way that the city clerk's office could handle that additional volume. What about I, the collections piece of it? Does that not? Well, that's where, in this case, we would, um, there are a lot of courts that have the collections in the municipal court. We would not do that. Um, they would, that collections clerk would be up there. So you would have two and a half to three clerks uh, that would, if they also did collections. Uh, when I was in Grand Chute, um, we had a municipal court that had about, roughly half the volume. There was a lot of traffic stuff in Grand Chute, so, but they had uh, two full-time clerks that dealt with all that and the collection. So scaling it out, this seemed very reasonable and that was similar to the experiences of the other courts that were doing that. Thank you. <clears throat> so anyway, that's the, uh, so we have other expenses in there and this is, this is all identified. A pe there's uh, the big spreadsheet of Appendix B has just the detail for the, um, for the staff itself, and again, it's a range of costs. And then there's upper, other operating costs that are Appendix B2, and that summarizes all those costs. Uh, to get to the point that um, Council Primary, you mentioned, software computer maintenance, uh, to get the Lexus system, it would require us to, uh, for our license, it would be 16400 annually. And that's something that we'd be required to do. We, you, you, we couldn't rely on you know, using somebody else's license. We, According to that licensing rules with Lexus, you have to get your own separate license. So it's 16400 annually. The other costs are relatively minor. Um, interpreter fees, um, it, you know, those, those types of things are, are relatively on the low side. But again, we estimated if you put them all together, and John, if you can move the next slide, uh, that's technology, and we've kind of talked about that already. The personnel, 275 to 335, technology other, 39, 40,000, 56,000. So the range is 315,000 to 391. Just for purposes of our discussion, we, we rounded those to the nearest 100,000, so three to 400,000. Um, on the revenue side, you know, we had to take a look at um, what experiences from other municipal courts um, as well as circuit courts. A 70% collection rate was um, a little on the high side, but for purposes of this analysis, we felt it was appropriate to go on the high side. Uh, it can be as 60% as is not unusual either. And in some rougher <laughs> areas, some uh, you can see the 30, 40%. But 70%, we decided to use a, a more op optimistic view just for illustration purposes here. Um, we do not include the fines we already receive as revenue because those fines are already going into the general fund. The, the municipal court will not be generating those revenues. Those revenues have already been generated through the police department and the court system 
when they get processed as they currently do. So in this analysis, we didn't count that. Um, the city would receive $33 in court costs per collected case. You'll, you would see, if you were paying a fine, you would see $38 in court costs. $5 automatically goes to the state, but we keep 33 But the advantage is, is that there are a lot of other costs that are collected at, uh, over at the circuit court that would um, no longer be collected. That's what I'd like to know is how much does it save the individual who's receiving the ticket? I know there's very a variation in fines, but base fine is $50 and then you add penalty assessment, court costs, jail assessment, training standards assessment, so that all adds on to the, so that so wouldn't be on our ticket. Someone receiving the <coughs> ticket, at, if there's a municipal, is going, it's going to cost them less Correct. than if yes. they're going through circuit. Do we Absolutely. Know? I, I was just conferring with Kurt to get my numbers right. A, a typical speeding ticket is in the 170s something, say 175-ish. In circuit court, in the municipal court, it's going to be about 96. Oh, wow. So, so significant ah. savings. So the person who's actually adjudicated guilty is going to have a savings. The city would get no more money. Well, it's the the city gets the same amount out of the circuit court or the um, municipal court for the forfeiture, and then the city would get that in a municipal court would get the 30. $38, which becomes $33 for court costs. However, the city might not co collect it directly, but presuming the majority of these are written to local residents, they would have money that they're otherwise spending in the community that wouldn't be in their pockets if it goes through circuit court, right? I don't think yeah. our goal is to save speeders money. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's not the purpose I, of this whole thing. I, I understand that, but um, and we cited that as an stage, you won't, it's a it won't cost you anything. But I mean, I guess the question is: our, is our effectiveness measured on changing behavior, or is our effectiveness measure on collecting the monies? I guess that's. Just a rhetorical, rhetorical question. Yeah, uh, there's, there's two sides to that, and, and I think you pointed it out. That's, that is clearly a, a benefit of, uh, of the municipal court. Um, what we had to do was, uh, we only looked at court costs, and we looked at the volume of cases we have, and the range is a low end based on uh, a lower collection rate and the higher collection rate. Um, there were some, during the surveys with the uh, police officers, <clears throat> they felt that they would write more tickets. Um, that is a very common response, and we found that as we surveyed other communities, there was an uptick after the initial court was put into place, but after a while it tapers off. I wouldn't say it necessarily goes back to the original numbers. It probably stays up a little bit, but you're not looking at a great percentage, which is why we showed a range here to demonstrate that, yeah, you, you may see an uptick in revenues, but you have to be, you have to keep that in uh, perspective because um, uh, even though it may be a, a, a less expensive ticket, um, it's not that the officers are necessarily going to say, oh, now we're going to write more tickets. I think <coughs> their whole goal, and I think that's the whole basis of community policing, right, uh, Kurt? That's yeah. They change behavior, not right. That's what charge. we look at first. That's why your point is is for me is very clear. My job is to change behavior. Uh, there's a lot of factors that stop, that, that come into a traffic stop or issuing a citation, not just the fine amount. That's one factor of many. So we brought these two analyses together, the expenditure and the revenue, and so we, we showed a best case where you get the most optimistic revenue and the least uh, expensive on the expense side and show a range that the net, it would be a net cost of the program of $75,000 up to $225,000, and that's just on an annual basis. It does not include the startup costs that we, we highlighted earlier. If you wanted to do an analysis, I would suggest that you take those startup costs and probably spread them out over 10 years because you would probably repeat those costs uh, either through facility renovations <coughs> or through um, uh, software updates because, and even 10 years isn't enough. They'd probably update them every five years or you'd be on the hook to to update them annually with a higher fee, but those costs are there. So you could add twenty to thirty thousand a year if you were amortizing that, say over a ten-year period, which would which wouldn't be unreasonable. But 
for purposes of annual revenues and expenses, uh, if we wanted to invest in the court, uh, that would be appropriate. Are there grants available for any of these startup costs, or can we accept donations when starting something like this? For example, the AED unit, could that item be donated for the use at a municipal court, or do you keep that separate from establishing something like this? I'm not aware of any grants for this type of thing. Usually when it comes to law enforcement, it's really a lot of the officer safety stuff that, that the police department gets periodically, you know, every you know decade or so, the federal government will do something on staffing. We got one a few years ago with a crime analyst position, um, and we'll wait another decade and you know, something will turn up again, but typically not not on that time. I've never seen anything like that, but uh, it's a great idea. Mark, I if I could, just in a general sense, grants have been on the decline just across the boards. There were a lot more grants years ago than there are not. They came back just a little bit, but we don't have near the grant money coming that we did, you know, say five years ago. Yeah, the ones we get now, we got the, the vests recently. We yeah, get some we get vests, vests and we get seatbelt uh, enforcement <clears throat> kind of things. And, you know, we, we do get some equipment. If we do enforcement for certain um, grants like seatbelt enforcement, you, you can pick from a list. It's usually a narrow list of, of uh, equipment that you can get as a benefit, um, but it's, it's drying up. So uh, that's kind of the financial analysis. So in summary, uh, the court is not necessarily cost effective, uh, and therefore, with as you get as you're getting your budget this evening, uh, with expenditure restraint, that's a real challenge. Even, um, and as I explained in the budget document, even if this was 100% covered, um, the insanity of the uh, expenditure restraint law is that. Um, you can't uh, make more to spend more. Um, we've spun off funds to do that. Um, we did kick around the idea, well, maybe we could make this a, an enterprise fund, but it technically doesn't qualify as an, as an enterprise fund under, uh, under GAAP. So that's, that's something we did take a look at. Um, one of the things that I did, I talked to probably four of the circuit court judges. Um, now with all, um, with full disclosure, I think most of them approached me rather than me approaching them, but I followed up with a few of them afterwards. Um, and for the most part, the circuit judges themselves don't get our cases. It's primarily the, um, the court commissioner that gets our cases. And, uh, and I think they recognize that if there are issues that we are not bringing to their attention, I don't think uh, up to this point they appreciated the amount of work that that John Zarati and his staff and inspections do to lead up to enforcement cases uh, with inspections. Uh, that's a small percentage, um, nine, ten percent of the court of the court commissioner's volume. Um, but I don't think they appreciate that. And I, I think we pointed that out to them so they understand that there's a lot of lead work we do. And uh, certainly the courts want to provide due process. And I think our staff provides a great deal of due process to to folks who are going through when we're enforcing something um, and I think there's a greater appreciation for that so I'm, I think we need to continue to have the conversations with the court on what we can do to better communicate our pre-court activities I see that as an opportunity for us we can't sit there and try to you know, lobby for a case it's just more in general showing them what we do so they have an understanding and then when we're in court uh, then it'll be they'll understand that there's a lot of work that goes into not just John's inspections, which are significant, but also every court case that the police department does. There's a lot of preparation for these things. I mean, when you get the volume, you have to work as efficiently as you can, but they don't take these cases lightly. And I think impressing on the courts that we do a lot of work and it should be recognized and factored in, I think is good. Um, but volume-wise, the circuit courts don't take a lot of volume, so uh, I, th I think working with them to maybe direct their court commissioners, because the judges, the judges are the ones who hire the court commissioners, and so they can give direction to court commissioners on generally how they should conduct themselves. Mark, who does, who does a municipal judge work for? So who's his employer? The people. No, no different than, than <laughs> you were elected by the he's, people. He's paid by the city? Correct. But yet, we have no really control over them. Correct. They are 
it's an independent part of the governmental system. You'll be creating a separate independent branch of the municipal government. So we could wind up with a good judge, a bad judge, or, an or in between. somewhere in between. Yep. Yeah, I put somewhere you know too lenient or too harsh. I mean, the, every if you get a ticket and then the judge rules you guilty, the judge is too harsh. I mean, it's just the way it is. Um, I have I just have a question. I don't know, Lynn or um, <coughs> the officer could maybe talk about this or not. But um, has there been any look, uh, any review as to in municipalities that have city courts? those ordinance violations being handled at the city level is there any difference in terms of outcomes in terms of uh, jail time less or more or um, besides the the money aspect um, in terms of you know non-payment of fines time do we have any data on that? we didn't gather any data on that I know that there are some municipal courts that use the warrant process there are a number of them that do not because there are costs associated with that as well and uh, we can address that at all because no it's just resources that's more resource manpower if there's a warrant issued obviously we have to spend time tracking that person down that that's not always an easy process so it, it, it would be time money resources yeah. I, I guess the reason I ask that is you know maybe I'm maybe I'm not thinking about this in the right way but if there's more jail that comes out of people not paying fines from the circuit court because they do use that correct then would there be less jail time for people who can't afford to pay fines at the municipal I guess that's where I'm kind of curious as to whether or not there's a you know a significant Studies difference on it. I, yeah. I wouldn't have any information on that Yeah, I, I don't, to, don't, to, I, don't I can answer a little of that, even though it's been seven years. Most municipal courts, if they issue a warrant, they'll say local jurisdiction or local ORI. Okay, so that means only in Oshkosh. Gotcha. So if the person goes to Fond du Lac and gets stopped for a speeding ticket, for speeding, let's just say, the warrant will show up, but it, they won't arrest them for it because it only is a local city of Oshkosh right. pickup area. It um, won't some will go two or three counties. I was going to ask if they would they still do that for because, or do it. But if it goes through circuit court, then the sheriff's office picks the person up, right. and pays the cost to go get them and bring them back to okay. the county jail. If it's our warrant, then our city officers have to leave the city and go get the person. There's not really a difference then in terms of severity, in terms of the ordinance violation versus no. the. Fel but see, the court, circuit, um, municipal courts can only handle, they can't handle so felonies, right? Right, just ordinance. Ordinance violation. Uh, just yes, city, city, ordinance. ordinance. city ordinances and city code ordinances. Mm -hmm. But if, if 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 it's a let's just say a homicide, we're not right, going to yeah. the municipal court's not going to get involved yeah. in something like that. Or even you know they could do a disorderly conduct, right? Municipal courts. If it's, if it's an ordinance violation for right. mm -hmm. yes. So Basically, they handle forfeiture cases only. Correct. Right. But I'm the one that brought this forward as one of the goals last year, and, and, and I'll just, it came out of our budget discussions and concerns with um, some of the, your cases that came out of the, your inspection cases. And, I, and you believe that with the discussions you're having and the things that um, are taking place, that the courts will be more open to understanding their process or I think procedures they are. that you know they get a notice to repair and fix and then they get you know we go back and it's a long process before we actually issue an ordinance violation for code violations most I cases. I think what we're hoping will happen is we'll educate them you know they're talking with Mark maybe us better educating the attorney that educates the judge hey look they've already spent six months trying to get this fixed mm -hmm. this wasn't they found the violation they gave him a citation they spend six months the judge understands that hey, it's been six months why should I give you any more time mm -hmm. okay yeah I, I did explain to the judges when John gives me one of these cases to take to court it's probably an inch thick mm -hmm. and I said you know that they, they just didn't throw that together this morning they have been working on these for months and I said and if so yeah I, I think the answer is yes um, I've been invited to uh, uh, to meet with all the judges and uh, 
and I'm happy to do that. Um, I normally ask council to give me direction within a month of this. Um, maybe this is one we just keep updating you on, and just you know, as we get uh, uh, just having discussions with the court and just letting them know that this is still very important to us because the effectiveness of the court is as important as anything. And I think we got to make sure that when we're putting a ton of staff resources into enforcement, that we get the bang for our buck. That we're that we're. Uh, it, we're exerting a lot of effort on these uh, enforcement cases. I think it's important to the, the dialogue with the judges and really uh, emphasize the need for it, how critical this is to the community. That uh, This is serious stuff and we need this. I think, right, we should keep monitoring it. And I view this as almost a continuous improvement process. It's going to involve a couple agencies, but I think <coughs> that's we need to take a look at it that way. Um, in some of its communications, I think some of the judges recognize, you know, I think maybe we need to talk a little bit about this a little more. And I certainly welcome that. Any other thoughts from council? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, everyone. Staff. We will convene in the chambers at 6 o'clock for our meeting. So you've got 20 minutes to kill, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Council is currently in a break. For a schedule of all GovTV programming, visit our website at oshkoshmedia.org. This is GovTV, opening accessibility and understanding of local government, helping you to be informed and involved. Also streaming live and on demand at oshkoshmedia.org and radio simulcast on Oshkosh FM 